What is a Horatio Alger story? It is any story about someone who, through sheer determination and good works, rises from poverty to wealth. During the second half of the 1800s, novels by American clergyman and author Horatio Alger Jr. 1832-1899, were extremely popular, he wrote more than 100 books. Including the Luck and Pluck and the Tattered Tom series. All of the stories center on a boy from inauspicious beginnings who through hard work, clean living, and a little bit of luck, become successful. Alger's real-life experience working with orphans and runaways in New York City provided the foundation for his works, which inspired countless readers and fed into the American dream. That the United States is a land ripe with possibility. Though dead for more than a century, Alger's name lives on. Many Americans still describe an honorable person's rise from rags to riches as a real Horatio Alger story. What was the goal of the Lewis and Clark expedition? The expedition, which began in 1804 and took more than two years to complete, had three purposes. To chart a route that would be part of a passage between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. To trace the boundaries of the territory obtained in the Louisiana Purchase, and to lay claim to the Oregon Territory. Thomas Jefferson 1743 to 1826, was President of the United States at the time. And he believed that a route could be found between St. Louis and the West Coast. As early as 1801, Jefferson had conceived of the idea that the Missouri and Columbia rivers might be followed west, leading to the Pacific. The journey would also be a reconnaissance mission. Information would be collected about the vast region and communications would be set up with its inhabitants. On April 30, 1803, the United States bought the Louisiana Territory from France. The purchase extended from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the Gulf of Mexico in the south to British America, Canada, in the north. Jefferson soon picked his private secretary. Virginia-born Meriwether Lewis, 1774-1809, to lead the westward expedition. Lewis then chose as his co-leader William Clark, 1770-1838, who as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, had served General Anthony Wayne on the frontier, 1792-96. Beginning in the summer of 1803, Lewis and Clark undertook the necessary preparations for the overland journey. These included studying the classification of plants and animals. Learning how to determine geographical position by observing the stars. And recruiting qualified men, mostly hunters and soldiers, for the expedition. On May 14, 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition left St. Lewis and headed up the Missouri River to its source. 
They then crossed the Great Divide and followed the Columbia River to its mouth, in present-day Oregon. At the Pacific Ocean, where they arrived in November 1805 one and a half years after they had set out. They arrived back in St. Louis on September 23, 1806, having gathered valuable information on natural features of the country, including its flora, fauna, and the Indian tribes who lived there. The expedition had been helped by the addition, in what is now North Dakota, of a Shoshone Indian woman named Sacagawea, C. 1786-1812. Lewis and Clark had hired her husband. French-Canadian trader Toussaint Charbonneau, as an interpreter during the winter of 1804-05. Lewis and Clark thought that Sacagawea would be able to help them communicate with the Shoshone living in the Rocky Mountains, which she later did. Her brother was their chief. After the expedition, Lewis was made governor of Louisiana Territory. A post he served from 1807 to 1809. Clark resigned from the army in 1807 and became brigadier. General of the militia and superintendent of Indian affairs for Louisiana Territory. In 1813 he became governor of the Missouri Territory, the Louisiana Territory less the state of Louisiana, which was organized as a state admitted into the Union in 1812, a post he held until 1821. What are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? The four horsemen of the apocalypse are allegorical figures mentioned in chapter 6 of Revelation. Also called the Revelation of St. John the Divine. The chapter describes a scroll, which contains seven seals and is held in God's right hand. When the first four of the seals are opened, the four horsemen appear each on a different colored horse. There are various interpretations of these allegorical figures. But the rider on the white horse is believed to represent conquest, or the return of Christ, the rider on the red horse is believed to represent war. The rider on the black horse, famine, and the pale horse, death. Some believe these hardships to be signs of the end of the world. The symbol of the four horsemen has appeared throughout art and literature. When did the Big Band era begin? On December 1, 1934, Benny Goodman's Let's Dance was broadcast on network radio, which effectively launched the swing era, in which big band music achieved huge popularity. Goodman, 1909-1986, was a virtuoso clarinetist and band leader. His jazz-influenced dance band took the lead in making swing the most popular style of the time. What is Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda, Arabic, meaning the base, is a global network of terrorists who banded together 
during the 1990s and proclaimed to be carrying out a holy war on non-Islamic nations. The group knows no national boundaries, though certain nations, including Afghanistan, were known to be Al-Qaeda strongholds. Led by the elusive Osama bin Laden, 1957, a wealthy exiled Saudi, the group conducted terrorist training programs in several Muslim, mostly Middle Eastern, countries and was funded by loyalists around the world. One of the United States' first actions following the September 11, 2001, terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon which were later confirmed to have been carried out by Al-Qaeda operatives, was to freeze bank accounts of persons and organizations with suspected ties to the terrorist group. The roots of Al-Qaeda can be traced to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, when thousands of Muslims, including bin Laden, joined the Afghan resistance. The 10 year conflict was a rallying point for Islamic extremists. Bin Laden returned home to Saudi Arabia in 1989, determined to perpetuate a holy war, jihad, by maintaining the funding, organization, and training that had made the Afghan resistance victorious against the Soviets. By the early 1990s he emerged as a leader in the Muslim world, proclaiming his goal to reinstate the caliphate, a unified Muslim state. He also proclaimed the United States to be an enemy to Islam. He considered the nation responsible for all conflicts involving Muslims. The Saudi government rescinded his passport in 1994, and bin Laden fled his homeland. He eventually found safe harbor in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. According to the report issued by the 9-11 Commission, bin Laden's declaration of war came in February 1998. When he and fugitive Egyptian physician Ayman al- Zawahiri arranged from their Afghanistan headquarters for an Arabic newspaper in London to publish what they termed a fatwa issued in the name of a World Islamic Front. The statement claimed that America had declared war against God and his messenger and they called for retaliation. Under bin Laden's direction, Al-Qaeda carried out several attacks on American targets, including the August 7, 1998, bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, which killed 258 and injured 5,000, and the September 11, 2001, attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon, which killed nearly 3,000 people. After the global coalition against terrorism, led by U.S. forces, launched its attack on Afghanistan in October 2001, bin Laden was believed to have fled for Pakistan, capturing him and other al-Qaeda leaders and operatives was the key objective of the United States in its efforts to dismantle the terrorist network. What was the philosophy of the Middle Ages? During medieval times, 500-1350, philosophers concerned themselves with applying the works of ancient Greek thinkers, such as Aristotle, 384-322b. C. 
and Plato, c. 428-347 BC, to Christian thought. This movement, which spanned most of the Middle Ages and reached its high water mark in the 13th century, was called scholasticism since its proponents were often associated with universities. The word scholastic is derived from the Greek scholastikos, meaning to keep a school. In the simplest terms, the goal of scholasticism has been described as the Christianization of Aristotle. Indeed, medieval philosophers strive to use reason to better understand faith. Scholasticism was, therefore, both rational and religious. The movement was also an interesting occasion of East meets West. The commentaries of Islamic philosophers, principally Ibn Nasr, c. 878-950, Averroes, 1126-1198, and Avicenna, 980-1037, figured prominently in scholasticism. Theologians including St. Anselm and St. Thomas Aquinas, used the non-Christian philosophy both of the ancient Greeks and of Muslim thinkers to better understand their own Christian faith. What was the kitchen cabinet? It was the name given to President Andrew Jackson's unofficial group of advisors, who reportedly met with him in the White House kitchen. The group included the then Secretary of State Martin Van Buren, 1782-1862, who went on to become Vice President, during Jackson's second term, and President from 1837-1841, F. P. Blair, 1791 to 1876, editor of the Washington Post, who was active in American politics and later helped get Abraham Lincoln elected to office, 1860, and Amos Kendall, 1789 to 1869, a journalist who was also a speech writer for Jackson and went on to become U.S. Postmaster General. The Kitchen Cabinet was influential in formulating policy during Jackson's first term, 1829-33. Many believe because the President's real cabinet, which he convened infrequently, had proved ineffective. But Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, drew harsh criticism for relying on his cronies in this way. When he reorganized the cabinet in 1831, the kitchen cabinet disbanded. Jackson's favoritism to his circle of friends did not end with the kitchen cabinet, however. During his presidency the spoils system was in full force. Jackson gave public offices as rewards to many of his loyal supporters. Though the term spoils system was popularized during Jackson's terms in office, it was his friend. Senator William Marcy, who coined the phrase when he stated, to the victor belong the spoils of the enemy. Jackson was not the first president to grant political powers to his party's members. And the practice continued through the 19th century. However, beginning in 1883 laws were passed that gradually put an end to, or at least limited, the spoil system.
What was the Boxer Rebellion? It was a Chinese uprising in 1900, which was put down through the combined forces of eight foreign countries including Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, and the United States. The Chinese-Japanese War, 1894-95, had seriously weakened China. And in 1898 the country agreed to lease its Kyoko region to Germany. Soon other European countries followed suit and before long Western influence was being felt in China. This angered many Chinese, including members of a secret society that opposed the Manchu government for having allowed the foreign incursions. This secret society was made up of athletic young men. And so they were called boxers by China's Westerners. Between June 21 and August 14, 1900, boxers rebelled against anything foreign and began a raid of the country that was intended to drive out all foreign influence. The uprising was aimed at not only Westerners and foreign diplomats, but missionaries, Chinese Christians, and any Chinese who were thought to support Western ideas. Houses, schools, and churches were burned. Much of the destruction took place in Beijing. And when foreign diplomats there called for help, it arrived from eight countries. The Manchu government did not welcome this interference in its affairs and promptly declared war on the eight nations. On September 7, 1901, the Manchu government signed a peace settlement with the foreign countries. The Boxer Protocol called for China to punish officials who had been involved in the rebellion and pay damages in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The United States, Britain, and Japan later returned part of the money to China, specifying that it be used for educational purposes. What was the Reformation? It was a religious movement in Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. It fomented inside the Catholic Church as people began questioning the Church's doctrines, practices, and authority. While the movement was preceded by a swelling dissatisfaction with the Church, the Reformation was officially, and some would say abruptly, begun in October 1517 when German monk and theology professor Martin Luther, 1483-1546, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church at Wittenberg. Saxony, Germany, launching an attack on the church. The movement continued through the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 48. And though the resolution to that conflict brought about a measure of religious stability in Europe, the force of the Reformation did not end there. Both the freedom of dissent and the Protestantism people know today are the byproducts of the movement. How many amendments have been made to the U.S. Constitution?
there have been 27 amendments to date. The following list gives brief summaries and the year each became part of the U.S. Constitution First Amendment through the Tenth Amendment, 1791 comprise the Bill of Rights. Eleventh Amendment, 1798 declares that U.S. federal courts cannot try any case brought against a state by a citizen of another state or country. Twelfth Amendment, 1804 revised the presidential and vice presidential election rules such that members of the electoral college, called electors, vote for one person as president and for another as vice president. Prior to the passage of this amendment, the electors simply voted for two men the one receiving more votes became president and the other became vice president. Thirteenth Amendment, 1865 prohibits slavery. Along with Amendments 14 and 15, these are sometimes called the Civil War Amendments. Fourteenth Amendment, 1868 Defines U.S. citizenship and gives all citizens equal protection under the law. This amendment made former slave citizens of both the United States and the state where they lived. It further forbade states to deny equal rights to any person. Fifteenth Amendment 1870 states that the right of U.S. citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. This amendment was meant to extend suffrage to black men. Sixteenth Amendment, 1913 authorizes a federal income tax. 17th Amendment, 1913 provides for the direct election of senators. Before this passed, state legislatures elected senators to represent them. This amendment gave that power to the people of each state. 18th Amendment, 1919 made prohibition legal. In other words, the manufacture and distribution of alcohol became illegal. 19th Amendment, 1920 grants women the right to vote. 20th Amendment, 1933 also called the Lame Duck Amendment. It changed congressional terms of office and the dates of the presidential inauguration so that newly elected officials take office closer to election time. 21st Amendment, 1933 repealed Amendment 18 to end Prohibition. 22nd Amendment, 1951 limits presidential tenure to two terms in office. A president can hold office for no more than 10 years two years as an unelected president and two terms as an elected president. 23rd Amendment, 1961 grants residents of Washington, D.C., the right to vote in presidential elections. 24th Amendment, 1964 outlaws the poll tax in all federal elections and primaries. Some states had used poll taxes as a way of keeping certain populations of voters from casting their ballots. The practice had served to disenfranchise blacks and poor people. 25th Amendment, 1967 provides for procedures to fill the vice presidency and further clarifies presidential succession rules. 
Upon removal, resignation, or death of the president, the vice president assumes the presidency. If a vice president is removed, resigns, or dies while in office, the president nominates a vice president who takes office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. 26th Amendment, 1971 lowers the voting age for federal and state elections to 18. 27th Amendment 1992 prevents Congress from passing immediate salary increases for itself. It requires that salary changes passed by Congress cannot take effect until after the next congressional election. This amendment had been passed by Congress in 1788 and was then sent to the states for ratification. Since the amendment had no time limit for ratification, it became part of the Constitution in 1992. After Michigan became the 38th state to ratify it, What was Camp David to? In July 2000 President Bill Clinton, 1946, invited Israeli and Palestinian Authority leaders to the presidential retreat at Camp David, Maryland, to hammer out a final peace agreement in the middle. East. In what could have been the major breakthrough in the conflict, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak 1942, agreed to a Palestinian state, including the West Bank and East Jerusalem and the administration of all Jerusalem holy sites by a third party, i.e. neither Israel nor Palestine. In exchange, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, 1929-2004, was asked to sign an end of conflict addendum to the final agreement, which would have required him to bring the militant Arab group Hamas under control and end all Palestinian attacks on Israelis. But Arafat refused the deal. The July 11 to 25th meeting ended without an agreement. Violence erupted again in Israel, beginning the Second Intifada. Who invented the telegraph? Though the invention came as the result of several decades of research by many people, Samuel F. B. Morse, 1791-1872, is credited with making the first practical telegraph. The first instrument that could send messages across wires via electricity, in 1837. Morse was a portrait painter in Boston when he became interested in magnetic telegraphy in about 1832, with technical assistance from chemistry professor Leonard Gale. 1800 to 1883, and financial support from Alfred Vail, 1807 to 1859, Morse conducted further experiments. He also developed Morse code, a system of variously arranged dots and dashes which can be used to transmit messages. For example, the most frequently used letter of the alphabet is E, which is rendered in Morse code by using one dot. The less frequently used Z is rendered by two dashes followed by two dots. By 1837 Morse had demonstrated the telegraph to the public in New York, Philadelphia. 
and Washington, D.C. He received a patent for his invention in the United States in 1840. In 1843 his invention got a boost when the U.S. Congress approved an experimental line to be built between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. The following year. On May 24, 1844, Morse sent his first message across that line, What hath God wrought? Vail was on the receiving end of the wire. By 1861 most major U.S. cities were linked by telegraph wires. The first successful transatlantic cables were laid in 1866. Morse code transmissions Called telegraphs when transmitted via above-ground wires and cablegrams, or cables, when transmitted via underwater cables. Were translated by operators or mechanical printers on both the sending and receiving ends of the message. The introduction of the telegraph marked the beginning of modern communications. When the first transcontinental telegraph line in the United States was completed on October 24, 1861, it eliminated the need for the Pony Express, which had briefly enjoyed the status of the fastest way to transmit a message about eight days from St. Louis, Missouri, to Sacramento, California. A distance that could be bridged by telegraph lines within minutes. The telegraph became the chief means of long distance communication. The telephone, invented 1875, which allows voice transmission over electrical wires, gradually replaced the telegraph. But for many decades the two technologies were both in use. What is known about Homer? It is most likely that Homer was an oral poet and performer. Though little is known about Homer, it's believed that he was an Ionian Greek who lived circa the 8th or 9th century BC. In the 1920s scholar Milman Perry proved that Homer's poems were formulaic in nature. Relying on generic epithets, such as Wine Dark Sea and Rosy Fingered Dawn. Repetition of stock lines and descriptions and themes typical of oral folk poetry. All of this suggested that Homer was most likely a bard or rhapsodon. Itinerant professional reciter who improvised pieces to be sung at Greek festivals. What are reparations? Reparations are payments or other compensations made to a group of people who have been wronged or injured. The issue was in the news in the 1990s and early 2000s as lawmakers, academics, and other leaders pressed for a redress for slavery which some scholars call the American, or Black, Holocaust. The precedents for making reparations were several, the German government made reparations to survivors and families of victims of the Nazi Holocaust, and the American government made reparations to Japanese Americans who had been interned during World War II. 1939 to 45 as well as to native americans for damages done to them the recent discussion of reparations began in 1989 when u.s representative john conyers 
Michigan, introduced a bill, H.R. 40, in Congress to establish a commission to examine the institution of slavery and economic discrimination against African Americans and if so determined, to make recommendations to the Congress on appropriate remedies. As the idea of reparations gained currency in the American public in the 1990s, supporters argued that redress for slavery would help heal the open wound of race relations and would compensate the descendants of slaves whose ancestors' work had helped build the national economy. They further argued that slavery resulted in long term discrimination that beleaguered black Americans. They were the victims of a centuries-old government-sanctioned system that established a legacy of race-based injustices. African-American activist and author Randall Robinson explained it this way. No nation can enslave a group of people for hundreds of years, set them free bedraggled and penniless to pit them. Without assistance, in a hostile environment against privileged victimizers, and then reasonably expect the gap between the ears of the two groups to narrow. Lines begun parallel and left alone can never touch. In bolstering support for reparations, Robinson pointed to the consequences of this massive injustice. That blacks in the United States experience high rates of infant mortality. Low incomes, high rates of unemployment, substandard education, high death rates. Below average lifespans, and overrepresentation in prisons and on death row. Critics of reparations said that compensating the descendants of slaves was unrealistic. Determining who would be paid would alone constitute an expensive government program. They also questioned why descendants of slaves should be paid by the government a century and a half after the end of the brutal system. Further, they argued that other programs, born of the civil rights movement, have strived to bring equity to African Americans. Despite criticism, Rep. Conyers resolved to reintroduce his bill as often as necessary until Congress would act on it. He emphasized that his goal was to create a commission, informed by town hall meetings, to first determine if there should be reparations and if so, who should be paid and how much. H.R. 40 had received the support of the city councils of Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, and Atlanta. What was the Chinese-Japanese War? It was a war fought in 1894 to 1895 over control of Korea, which was a vassal state of China. When an uprising broke out in Korea in 1894, China sent troops in to suppress it. Korea's ports had been open to Japan since 1876 and in order to protect its interests there. Japan, too sent troops to the island nation when trouble broke out. But once the rebellion had been put down, the Japanese troops refused to withdraw. In July 1894 fighting broke out between Japan and China. With Japan emerging as the victor, having crushed China's navy. A peace treaty signed on April 17. 1895, provided for an independent Korea. 
which only lasted until 1910, when Japan took possession. And for China to turn over to Japan the island of Taiwan and the Liaodong Peninsula, the peninsula was later returned to China for a fee after Russia. Germany, and France forced Japan to do so. The war, though relatively brief, seriously weakened China, and in the imperialist years that followed. The European powers scrambled for land concessions there. Why was Jesus feared by the authorities? There were two reasons Jesus, see. 6b.ccad30, was feared by Palestine's leaders. First, as an advocate of the poor. He was an outspoken critic of the privileged as well as of Palestine's oppressive Roman rulers. Palestine was part of the Roman province of Syria during the lifetime of Jesus. Jesus openly accused the ruling class of hypocrisy and injustices. Second, some feared that if Jesus was the Messiah, he would lead a revolution. So the governors viewed him and his teachings as a threat to their authority. Is it true that Moses never entered the Promised Land? Yes, according to the Bible, Moses, who was 80 years old when he led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, never entered the Promised Land of Canaan. After parting the Red Sea, which had swallowed up the Egyptian soldiers who pursued the Israelites as they fled. Moses led the people into the desert, embarking on what turned out to be a 40-year journey to Canaan. During this time, which is also described as 40 years of wandering, the Israelites lived under harsh conditions. This led them to distrust a God they could not see and to challenge Moses's authority. But Moses frequently appealed to God for help, and the Bible reports that he received it. In one instance, Numbers 20,22-12, God directed Moses to get water for the parched Israelites and their livestock by ordering a rock to yield its water. But instead of speaking to the rock, Moses struck it twice with his staff. Even though water gushed out of the rock, Moses had failed to follow God's instructions. Therefore, God later said to Moses, Because you were not faithful to me, you shall not lead this community into the land I will give them. Eventually the Israelites reached Canaan, ancient Palestine. But God did not allow Moses to enter the promised land he only viewed it from atop Mount Pisgah. In present day Jordan, before he died. What was the peasants war? Fought in 1524 and 1525, the war was in part a religious one that came during the Reformation. It was the greatest mass uprising in German history. In 1517 the GER man monk Martin Luther, 1483-1546.
had begun questioning the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. He soon had followers nobles and peasants alike and his reform movement spread, giving birth to Protestantism. The Christian beliefs practiced by those who protested against the Catholic Church. While many Protestants were sincere in their faith, some had their own motives for following the movement. German peasants looked to the Reformation to end their oppression at the hands of the noble lords. When the peasants revolted at the end of 1524, they were forcibly suppressed. Some 100,000 peasants died. Prior to the uprising, they had aimed to get Martin Luther's endorsement, but he declined to give it. How were finished goods produced before the Industrial Revolution? Before the factory and machine age ushered in by the Industrial Revolution, people made many of their own finished goods, bought them from small-scale producers, who manufactured the goods largely by hand or bought them from merchants who contracted home workers to produce goods. The putting out system was a production method that was used in New England from the mid-1700s to the early 1800s. It worked this way, merchants supplied raw materials, cotton, for example. To families, especially women and young girls, who would make partially finished goods, thread, or fully finished goods, cloth, for the merchant. These manufactured goods were then sold by the merchant. Homeworkers, who put out goods, provided the needed manufacturing labor of the day. Why did the U.S. government send troops after Pancho Villa? Pancho Villa, 1878-1923, was sought by the U.S. government because in 1916 he and his followers attacked Americans on both sides of the border. In 1915 the United States decided it would back the acting chief of Mexico. Venustiano Carranza, 1859-1920, even as he faced attacks from two of his fellow revolutionaries. Emiliano Zapata, 1879-1919, and Pancho Villa. Four years earlier, Villa had himself sought to control Mexico after the fall of President Porfirio Diaz. When the United States cut off the flow of ammunition to the rebels, Villa, who was a fierce fighter, earned himself a reputation as a bandit. Seeking revenge on Americans in Mexico by stopping trains and shooting the passengers. In 1916 Villa raided the small New Mexico village of Columbus, where he killed 18 people. The attack prompted President Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924, to send U.S. soldiers to hunt Villa down and capture him. Though thousands of men were put on the initiative under General John Pershing. 1860 to 1940, they never caught up with the bandit. Wilson withdrew the forces from Mexico after the government there expressed resentment for the U.S. effort which the Mexican people, President Carranza included. 
viewed as a meddlesome American interference in the Mexican Revolution, 1910-20. The revolution ended three years later, after ten years of fighting and disorder. What is Keynesian economics? Keynesian economics are the collected theories of British economist and monetary expert John Maynard Keynes. 1883-1946, who in 1935 published his landmark work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. A macroeconomist, he studied a nation's economy as a whole. Keynes departed from many of the concepts of a free market economy. In order to ensure growth and stability. He argued that government needs to be involved in certain aspects of the nation's economic life. He believed in state intervention in fiscal policies. And during recessionary times he favored deficit spending, the loosening of monetary policies. And government public works programs, such as those of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, to promote employment. Keynes's theories are considered the most influential economic formulation of the 20th century. Having played a central role in British war financing during World War II, 1939-45. Keynes participated in the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944, where he helped win support for the creation of the World Bank. Which was established in 1945 as a specialized agency of the United Nations. The body aims to further economic development by guaranteeing loans to nations, extending easy credit terms to developing nations, and providing risk capital to promote private enterprise in less developed nations. It's interesting to note that Keynes was a key representative at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, where the Treaty of Versailles was drawn up, officially ending World War I, 1914-18. He quit the proceedings in Paris, returned to private life in London, and in 1919 published The Economic Consequences of Peace, in which he argued against the excessive war reparations that the treaty required of Germany. Keynes foresaw that the extreme punishment of Germany at the end of World War I would pave the way for future conflict in Europe. What was the first big union? The first national union of note was the Knights of Labor, founded by garment workers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in 1869, recruiting women, blacks, immigrants, and unskilled and semi-skilled workers alike. The Knights of Labor's open membership policy provided the organization with a broad base of support. Something previous labor unions which had limited membership based on craft or skill, lacked. The organization set its objectives on instituting the eight-hour workday, prohibiting child labor. Under age 14, instituting equal opportunities and wages for women laborers, and abolishing convict labor. The group became involved in numerous strikes from the late 1870s to the mid-1880s. At the same time, 
a faction of moderates within the organization was growing. And in 1883 it elected American machinist Terence Powderly, 1849-1924, as president. Under Powderly's leadership, the Knights of Labor began to splinter. Moderates pursued a conciliatory policy in labor disputes. Supporting the establishment of labor bureaus and public arbitration systems, radicals not only opposed the policy of open membership. They strongly supported strikes as a means of achieving immediate goals including a one-day general strike to demand implementation of an eight-hour workday. In May 1886 workers demonstrating in Chicago's Haymarket Square attracted a crowd of some 1,500 people. When police arrived to disperse them, a bomb exploded and rioting ensued. Eleven people were killed and more than 1,000 were injured in the melee. For many Americans, the event linked the labor movement with anarchy. That same year several factions of the Knights of Labor seceded. From the Union to join the American Federation of Labor, AFL. The Knights of Labor remained intact for three more decades, before the organization officially dissolved in 1917. By which time the group had been overshadowed by the AFL and other unions. Why was Ford's Model T important? The enormous success of the Model T, a Ford Motor Company car introduced in 1908 and manufactured until 1927, has been the source of extensive analysis and commentary by historians. Sociologists, economists, business writers, and pop culture experts. The Model T has been credited with not only changing America but with defining it. When Ford Motor Company founder and President Henry Ford 1863-1947, unveiled the prize Model T in October 1908, he hailed it as a motor car for the great multitude. The product lived up to the promise. The internal combustion vehicle had been in production in the United States only since the 1890s. But in the decade preceding the Model T's debut, manufacturers and consumers alike had come to regard the horseless carriage as a luxury item custom made for wealthy Americans. Ford had conceived of a different end, as the company would advertise throughout the century. A better idea, a car that was simple to operate, easy to service, comfortable, and affordable. The Model T had a wooden body on a steel frame, four-cylinder, 20-horsepower engine. Tank capacity of 10 gallons, in the touring sedan, or 16 gallons. In the runabout, and a completely enclosed power plant and transmission. It was also lighter than other models. Through large scale production, based on a system of interchangeable parts. The Model T took 728 minutes, just more than 12 hours, to build and sold for $850, lower than the price of other automobiles. But still beyond the reach of the average American. Nevertheless, 17,000 Model TS were bought by American consumers the year they were introduced. 
Ford improved production methods to realize greater economies and lower the price each year, sales steadily rose. The company raised eyebrows in the business community when it offered workers an 8-hour day for $5 a day twice what other factory workers were earning. Ford explained that this was merely good business practice. By raising the wages of his factory workers, Ford enlarged the potential market for his Model T. In 1914 Ford implemented the moving assembly line. It used the principles of scientific management, where each job has one best way of being accomplished. To bring unprecedented efficiency to manufacturing. Assembly time per car dropped to just 90 minutes. That year the Ford plant in Highland Park, Michigan, produced almost 250,000 Model T.S. To keep up with ever-rising demand, operations were sped up and capacity increased to the point that one day in 1925, Ford produced one Model T every 10 seconds. That year the car retailed for just $295, making the so-called Tin Lizzie. Or the Fliver, accessible to working-class families. By 1927, when Ford retired the Model T so the company could respond to consumer demand for cars with better performance, power, and styling, the company had turned out 15 million tin lizzies. Ford's innovative Model T, a reliable, no-nonsense, mass-produced automobile. Manufactured on a moving assembly line, brought mobility within the reach of the average American. It had changed consumer mindset to view the car as a necessity. What are the milestones in the motion picture industry? Motion pictures continue to develop as new. Sophisticated technologies are introduced to improve the moviegoing experience for audiences. In the decades following their rudimentary beginnings, there were many early milestones. Including not only advancements in technology but improvements. In conditions for those working in the then-fledgling industry, 1903, Edwin S. Porter's The Great Train Robbery was the first motion picture to tell a complete story. Produced by Edison Studios, the 12-minute epic established a pattern of suspense drama that was followed by subsequent movie makers. 1907 Bell and Howell Co. was founded by Chicago movie projectionist Donald H. Bell and camera repairman Albert S. Howell with $5.000 in capital. The firm went on to improve motion picture photography and projection equipment. 1910, Brooklyn Eagle newspaper cartoonist John Randolph Bray pioneered animated motion picture cartoons. Using a cell system he invented and which was subsequently used by all animators. 1912, Queen Elizabeth, starring Sarah Bernhardt, was shown July 12 at New York's Lyceum Theater and was the first feature-length motion picture seen in America. 1915, D.W. Griffiths The Birth of a Nation provided the blueprint for narrative films. 1925
The new editing technique used in Potemkin revolutionized the making of motion pictures around the world. Soviet film director Sergei Eisenstein created his masterpiece by splicing film shot at many locations. An approach subsequently adopted by most film directors. 1926, the first motion picture with sound, talkie, was demonstrated. 1927, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences was founded by Louis B. Meyer of MGM Studios. The first president of the Academy was Douglas Fairbanks. 1927, the first full-length talking picture, The Jazz Singer, starring vaudevillian Al Jolson, was released. By 1932 all movies talked. 1929, the first Academy Awards. Four 1928 films, were held, winners were William Wellman for Wings. Emil Janings for Best Actor, in Last Command, and Janet Gaynor for Best Actress, in Sunrise. Movie columnist Sidney Skalski dubbed the awards the Oscars. 1928, Hollywood's major film studios signed an agreement with the American Telephone and Telegraph Corporation. AT&T to use their technology to produce films with sound. Leading to an explosion in the popularity of motion pictures. 1929, Eastman Kodak introduced 16mm film for motion picture cameras. 1933, The Screen Actors Guild, SAG was formed when six actors met in Hollywood to establish a self-governing organization of actors. The first organizing meeting yielded 18 founding members. 1935, the first full-length Technicolor movie was released, Becky Sharp. The technology, however, was still in development, and the colors appeared garish. 1939, Gone with the Wind was released in Technicolor, which had come a long way since its 1935 debut. 1939. When did the American cattle industry begin? 1939. As a large-scale commercial endeavor. The beef industry had its beginnings in the decades following the American Civil War, 1861-65. Longhorn cattle, a breed of cattle descended from cows and bulls left by early. Spanish settlers in the American Southwest, spurred the growth of the industry. Named for their long horns, which span about four feet, by the 1860s they had multiplied and great numbers of them roamed freely across the open range of the West. Ranchers in Texas bred the Longhorns with other cattle breeds such as Hereford and Angus to produce quality meat. With beef in demand in the eastern United States. Shrewd businessmen capitalized on the business opportunity, buying cattle for $3 to $5 a head and selling them in eastern and northern markets for as much as $25 to $60 a head. Ranchers hired cowboys to round up, sort out, and drive their herds to railheads in places like Abilene and Dodge City, Kansas which became famous as cow towns. Raucous boom towns where saloons and brothels proliferated. After the long trail drive, 
the cattle were loaded onto rail cars and shipped live to local butchers who slaughtered the livestock and prepared the beef. For a 20-year period the plentiful longhorn cattle sustained a booming livestock industry in the West. At least 6 million Texas longhorns were driven across Oklahoma to the cow towns of Kansas. By 1890 the complexion of the industry changed. Farmers and ranchers in the West used a new material, barbed wire, to fence in their lands. Closing the open range, railroads were extended, bringing an end to the long, hard, and much glorified cattle drives, the role of the cowboy changed. Making him little more than a hired hand, and big business took over the industry. Among the entrepreneurs who capitalized on beef's place in the American diet was New England-born Gustavus Swift. 1839-1903, who in 1877 began a large-scale slaughterhouse operation in Chicago. Shipping ready-packed meat via refrigerated railcars to markets in the East. Why was the completion of the Erie Canal important to you? S. Development Completed in 1825, the Erie Canal joined the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes. Linking the east with the west and for the first time allowing freight and settlers to easily move back and forth between the regions. Begun on July 4, 1817, the canal was sponsored by Governor DeWitt Clinton. 1769 to 1828, of New York, who planned and eventually carried out the huge building project. The waterway was funded by the state of New York, which paid just over $7 million to complete it. The original canal was 363 miles long, 40 feet wide at the surface, and 4 feet deep. It had 83 locks, which raised vessels 562 feet between the Hudson River and Lake Erie. A lock is a section of a canal that can be closed to control the water level and is then used to either raise or lower a vessel to another body of water. Beginning at Albany, New York, on the Hudson River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean at New York City. The canal extends west as far as Buffalo, New York, on Lake Erie, one of the five Great Lakes. The waterway, which was inaugurated by the run of the Barge Seneca Chief on October 26, 1825, could transport passengers aboard boats and move cargo aboard barges, which were pulled by teams of horses and mules on the ground. In spite of the critics, who dubbed the ambitious project Clinton's Wonder and Clinton's Ditch, the canal's positive impact on the American economy was felt within the first decade of its operation. The new transportation route reduced freight rates both eastward and westward. Made Buffalo a major port in the region and New York City a major international port, was a catalyst for population growth. In upstate New York and throughout the Old Northwest, the present-day states of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota, and prompted other states, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, to build canals, further opening up the country's interior to development and commerce. 
since crops could be shipped from these lush farmlands and as more farms came into existence. The Erie Canal helped supply the newly arrived immigrants in the eastern cities with food. In turn, they shipped manufactured goods west to the farming communities. The canal was enlarged several times between 1835 and 1862 to increase its capacity. In 1903 New York voted to link the canal with three shorter waterways in the state to form the New York State Barge Canal, which opened in 1918. Why are Thomas Paine's philosophies important to democratic thought? English political philosopher and author Thomas Paine, 1737-1809 Believed that a democracy is the only form of government that can guarantee natural rights. Paine arrived in the American colonies in 1774. Two years later he wrote Common Sense. A pamphlet that galvanized public support for the American Revolution, 1775-83, which was already underway. During the struggle for independence, Paine wrote and distributed a series of 16 papers. Called Crisis, Upholding the Rebels' Cause in Their Fight. Paine penned his words in the language of common speech, which helped his message reach a mass audience in America and elsewhere. He soon became known as an advocate of individual freedom. The fight for freedom was one that he waged in letters. In 1791 and 1792 Payne, now back in England. Released the Rights of Man, in two parts, a work in which he defended the cause of the French Revolution. 1789-99, and appealed to the British people to overthrow their monarchy. For this he was tried and convicted of treason in his homeland. Escaping to Paris, the philosopher became a member of the Revolutionary National Convention. But during the Reign of Terror, 1793-94, of revolutionary leader Maximilien Robespierre, 1758-1794, Paine was imprisoned for being English. An American minister interceded on Paine's behalf, insisting that Paine was actually an American. Paine was released on this technicality. He remained in Paris until 1802, and then returned to the United States. Though he played an important role in the American Revolution by boosting the morale of the colonists. He nevertheless lived his final years as an outcast and in poverty. Who was Dame Margot Fontaine? Fontaine, 1919-1991 has been called an international ambassador of dance. The British-trained ballerina achieved worldwide fame and recognition during more than 34 years with the Royal Ballet. Expanding the company's female repertoire and becoming the model for the modern ballerina. In 1962, at the age of 43, Fontaine formed a dance partnership with Soviet defector Rudolf Nureyev. 1938-1993, Challenging Traditional Assumptions 
about the ability of mature dancers to continue vigorous performance careers. In her later years, she continued to be active in the world of dance, helping set up dance scholarships. Fostering international artistic relations, and encouraging the growth of dance institutions around the world. Which you? S. State was the first to abolish slavery. Vermont was first, in 1777. On July 8 of that year Vermont adopted a state constitution that prohibited slavery. The first document in the United States to outlaw slavery, it read in part, no male person. Born in this country, or brought from overseas, ought to be holden by law, to serve any person, as a servant. Slave or apprentice, after he arrives to the age of 21 years, nor female, in like manner. After she arrives to the age of 18 years, unless they are bound by their own consent. After they arrive to such age, or bound by law, for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. Vermont's constitution also gave suffrage to all men, regardless of race. Vermonters were the first to put a black legislator in the state house, Alexander Twilight. 1795 to 1857, was elected as a representative in 1836. Twilight also earned another first. In 1823 he graduated from Vermont's Middlebury College to become the first black person in the nation to earn a college degree.